Okay, so welcome to this first video in the playlist on Galois theory. Okay, so we're going to discuss in this video a very important uh, construction that's going to be important uh, for what we want to discuss later in this playlist. Okay, so we're going to discuss uh, the construction of the field of fractions for an integral domain. Okay, so the structure of this video then, we're going to start off uh, with the definition of an integral domain, just to make sure that everyone's comfortable with that. Then we will uh, discuss the example, the key example of an integral domain, uh, which is uh, the rationals. We'll then discuss the whole motivation for what we're going to do, which is extending uh, the integral domain uh, so that we can build a field which contains that integral domain. Okay, and then we'll actually look at the construction as to how we're going to do this. What we'll then do is uh, look at how uh, the thing that we construct, which is going to be this field of fractions, actually is a field. So we'll look at how we're going to define addition and multiplication and firstly check that those are well defined and then uh, check that uh, they actually do obey the uh, axioms of field theory. Right, so let's start off with the definition of an integral domain. Okay, so an integral domain is an algebraic structure and basically it's a modified commutative ring. Okay, so, uh, what's well, it's a special commutative ring. Okay, so, uh, let's remind ourselves of what a commutative ring is then. So, a domain is often abbreviated by D like this, and often people will drop the integral, they'll just call it a domain. Okay, so, integral domain, and it's often abbreviated just by D. Okay, so foremostly, it is just a set, okay, so it's some set containing a bunch of symbols, okay, and then what you do is you define a, um, a Belian group structure on this um, set of symbols, which is known as the first operation, and the first operation is called addition. So we could put a Cayley table here, and we put all of the set, all, sorry, all of the members of the uh, set here, and all of the members of the set down here, and then we define what um, one added to the other is, etc. And this forms an abelian group, okay? So it's a commutative group. And then what we do is we define a second operation on the uh, set, which is called multiplication. Okay, and again, we can draw a table for this. So we'll have every single element in the domain here, and then every single element in the domain down here as well. And we'll define what every element multiplied by every other element is. Okay. Now, uh, this doesn't have to form a group structure. In fact, if it did form a group structure, then it wouldn't obey another very beautiful property. There's a more important property that we want it to obey. You could define just another group structure on, but then I guarantee it wouldn't be a very interesting structure. All you would have is basically two groups sitting on top of each other. The key thing that we want this to obey is we want some sort of interaction between the two operations. We want distributivity, and if you insist on on distributivity, you can't get this to obey a group ax, um, a group structure, basically. You can get very close, but you can't quite get there. Okay, so the closest you can get is when uh, this then uh, obeys the axioms of field theory. Now, we're not quite there. This is going to be an integral domain. So what axioms is it going to obey? Well, it's going to firstly obey uh, the fact that it will have an identity. Okay, so there will be a multiplicative identity. Now, usually the multiplicative identity is given the symbol 1, uh, obviously for old re reasons. Okay, so the multiplicative identity will usually be denoted as 1, just as the additive identity, the identity of this group structure here, is usually denoted as 0. Okay, so this 1, this multiplicative identity, is the number or the symbol uh, which can be multiplied on either side with any element in the domain. Okay, so 1 times a, uh, a, where a is any element from the domain, and this will just give back that same element there, okay? In addition, it works the other way as well, so you can take any element and multiply it by 1, and that will just give that same element back again. Right, so you have an identity. It's also going to obey associativity. Okay, so the fact that A times B, okay, so if you get the answer for A times B, so you take 
some symbol in the domain, multiply it by another symbol B in the domain, get some answer which is in this composition table here. Take that answer, okay, whatever it is, so let's say here we now have A times B, and then multiply it by another symbol C, and this should equal the same thing as A times the answer to B times C. Now that is really not trivial that that is true, because if you think about this, if we put just three symbols in for a moment, okay, so let's have three symbols, A, B, and C, and A, B, and C here. Okay, so A times B is this, whoops, this symbol here, okay? So you take whatever is in that position there, so this is A, we've multiplied it by B, so whatever is in that position, you take that, and you take it and multiply it by C, and you get some other answer. Whereas, in this case, B times C, so here's B, and here's C, so that's that element there, and you're taking A, and you're multiplying it by whatever that element is there. So we don't know what these two elements are, so really we don't have much control over this in the most general sense. If we were just making up uh, symbols here, it would be very easy for us to uh, make structures that didn't obey associativity. So that is a huge property. That's really, uh, if you were going to pick one property that best describes what algebra is about. Algebra is about associativity, basically. Okay. Um, then the other thing that uh, you need in a ring, at the moment we're just discussing rings, okay, so we'll go on to discuss commutative rings and then find the integral domains, but for the time being we'll just discuss what a ring is, so we'll build up to an integral domain, okay. Uh, so, finally you then need some sort of property that connects the two operations, okay, and this is the distributive property, so we also need distributivity. Okay, and distributivity is the one thing that connects the two. So this says that if you take A, okay, so any symbol in the domain, multiply it by, or the ring, if, because we're talking about rings, uh, multiply it by some symbol which is B plus C. Okay, so you take two symbols, B and C, you compose them together under the first operation, addition. Okay, so you take B plus C, that gives you some symbol in here, and you take that symbol, and you take A and you multiply it by that symbol, then that's going to be the same thing as if you take A and multiply it by B, okay, and then add that to A multiplied by C, and that, again, is really not trivial. Okay, so these are the familiar properties from the common algebras that everyone knows, uh, but they're not trivial, basically. If you were just defining symbolic uh, composition laws like this, you'd have a hard time getting it to obey all of these things, unless you had some wit about you. Okay, uh, now this is what's called right distributivity. Uh, sorry, no, this is not right distributivity, this is left distributivity, because this is on the left at the moment. Okay, so this is the left rule, okay, but you also, because I haven't said the ring is commutative yet, so you also need to say that it works when the thing that you're multiplying is on the right. So when you take B plus C and you multiply that by A, whatever the answer to that is, that's going to be the same thing as if you take B, multiply it by A, and then add it to C multiplied by A. Okay, and this is right distributivity. So, those are the axioms that uh, rings obey. Now let's modify it, let's go up a step. Let's uh, take it to a commutative ring. So commutative rings obey one more property. Okay, so now we'll have a commutative ring. So commutative rings obey commutativity in the second operation. Okay, so we know uh, that all rings are commutative in the first operation because they're based on an abelian group for addition. But they don't necessarily have to be uh, commutative with respect to the second operation. So matrix rings are the key examples uh, which aren't commutative uh, with respect to the second operation. Okay, uh, but we'll study commutative rings, so this means that A times B, okay, so if you take A, multiply it by B, this is the same thing as if you take B and multiply it by A, so this number in this socket is the same as the number in this socket here, basically. So the composition table is going to be symmetric down the diagonal, okay, so this is equal to B times A. So that's commutative property.
Then, finally, to take it up to an integral domain, okay? So an integral domain is one step up from a commutative ring. So you start with a ring, you go to a commutative ring, and now integral domains are going to obey all of the previous properties right up to commutativity, but now they're going to obey one more property, which is that if you have two numbers, okay, A and B, and you multiply them together, and you get the answer zero, then either A is equal to zero, or B is equal to zero. So the only way that two numbers can be composed together and get zero is if one of them is the additive identity. Okay, so basically what this means is that if we look at the composition table, then somewhere we'll have the additive identity and it's usually put right at the end, basically. And then we'll have all the other elements here. Basically, you cannot... Okay, so let me just get my colours out. You cannot multiply any non sorry any two non zero numbers okay together and get zero so you can't take a number in here and a number in here compose them together by multiplication and get zero so none of the numbers in this portion down here okay in this portion of the composition table are zero so there's no zeros okay in an integral domain in this portion here of course, whenever you multiply um, the additive identity by anything, you get zero. So all of these elements in these portions are zero. And the reason that when you multiply any um, element of the domain by zero on either the left or the right, uh, you get zero, is that if you want it to obey the distributive property like this, you can't help it, basically, because... If you think about it, a times b, if you take a times b, this is the same thing as a times b plus 0. Because if you take b and compose it by addition and add it onto the additive identity, then the answer to this is always just b. Okay, so this is a times b but also by distributive property, because we've insisted that it obeys the distributive property because of the ring properties, then it is also equal to a times b uh, plus a times 0. And I should put brackets to tell you what to do first. Okay, So, we've got that a times b, therefore, is equal to a times b plus a times 0. Okay, so compose on both sides by the additive inverse of a times b, whatever that number is. It's just some symbol in the domain, so it has a additive inverse. Compose on both sides by its additive inverse. On this side, it will just get rid of that one, and then on this side, we'll go down to zero. So we get that a times zero must equal the zero, okay, which tells us that anything times 0 must equal to 0. So that tells us that this entire column must equal 0. Then from right distributivity, we can get that the exact same thing, basically. So if we do it again for right distributivity, okay, we can say that a times b is the same thing as a plus 0 times b for exactly the same reason, because a plus 0 is just a again, because 0 is the additive identity. Okay, then we can apply right distributivity here. So we don't even need the commutative property. If you've got that it's a commutative ring, then you can do this even more easily. You can just say, okay, well, uh, a times zero is the same thing as zero times a. If you don't have the distributive, sorry, the commutative property, you can do it anyway from right distributivity. Okay, so we'll do it from right distributivity because that's kind of more pure. We do it in the more general case then. Okay. Um, and so we've agreed that this is equal to this, uh, but now we can apply right distributivity and say that this is a times b plus 0 times b. Then what we can do is, you know, add on the uh, additive inverse of a times b, which is often denoted as negative a times b, okay? And then we take off a times b off from this side, you'll go back to the additive identity, because that's the definition of the additive inverse of a times b, that it's the thing which adds on to a times b to give the additive identity. And then on this side, we can just apply a bit of commutativity and associativity here, uh, because of course we should really have brackets there. Um, but what we can do is swap these two around and then apply the associative property and uh, 
uh, Bob's your uncle, we get that this is equal to 0 times b, okay? And therefore we get that 0 is equal to 0 times b, so 0 times anything is equal to 0. So all of these things in this uh, row here are equal to 0. So that's true for any ring, basically, that all of these entries here in the Cayley table, and this is the multiplicative operation, all of them are equal to 0. Now, in a normal ring, even in commutative rings, uh, it's not necessary that these terms here necessarily don't have to be zero. So you could have some of these non-zero terms multiplying together to give zero, basically. So you might have some zeros in this portion of the Cayley table. In an integral domain, what we insist on is that none of these entries in this portion of the Cayley table are equal to zero. So that's the special thing about an integral domain, and that is why this can be extended into a field, basically. Because fields have the very special property that if you look at the entries in a either a row or a column, okay, so if you pick a row or a column like this, then basically within each row or column like this, you will find every single one of the, um, one of the members of the domain, okay, uh, and you'll only find it once, okay, so in a each row and each column of the uh, Cayley table for multiplication in the field, you must find every element of the domain somewhere, and it can only appear once. So if we had a zero here, okay, then that would ruin this instantly, because look, we then have zero appearing twice, and this couldn't possibly be extended into a field, therefore, because how on earth could you incorporate this into a field? Because fields have to have this property where um, where the um, each row and each column contains every single element of the domain, and this obviously has t two exceptions. Firstly, this row up here obviously only contains one element, which is the additive identity, and this column here, again, only contains one element, which is the additive identity. That's okay in a field, uh, but all other uh, rows and columns, apart from those two, must contain every single element, and that's the equivalent thing to saying that your principal, uh, your sorry, your principal ideal, okay, is either um, the zero ideal, i.e., only contains zero, or it's the entire set. So it's the equivalent thing to saying that basically fields have only two ideals: either uh, they have um, either it's the zero ideal or the entire field, basically. And these columns, they are the principal ideals, so um, they must either be the entire field or they must just be at the zero, um, so they must only have zero in. Okay, uh, so this is why integral domains are the only things that we can extend into fields and we can't extend a general ring into a field, and I'll come back to that later. Right, okay, so now we've discussed what an integral domain is. Uh, let's discuss the um, sort of principal example of an ideal, uh, sorry, of an integral domain, which is the integers. Okay, so uh, the integers as an integral domain. Then, so we'll discuss this here. So the integers are all of the whole numbers. Okay, so it's a, the set is zero, one, negative one, two, negative two, three, negative three, onwards, etc. So it's an infinite set, but it's a nice countably infinite set. Okay, right, so we have an addition defined on the integers, which forms a nice abelian group, and we then have a multiplication defined on the integers, which forms an integral domain, okay? Uh, so we have a multiplicative identity, which is 1. We certainly have associativity in this, because, you know, this is the old uh, number system that people um, who haven't studied abstract algebra know how to use, and they rec would recognize these properties. They'd think they were trivial if you actually emphasize them to them, because the only number systems they've ever learned are, uh, well, they all obey these properties. Okay, it obviously obeys distributivity. Uh, commutativity again obeys. Let's just make sure it obeys this final integral domain property. Okay, so if two numbers multiply together to equal zero, 
Does that imply that 1 was equal to 0? Well, yes, that is true. You can't take any two whole numbers, multiply them together and get 0, unless one of them is 0, basically. So 0 times anything will give you 0, and also uh, 0 times 0 obviously gives you 0, but you can't take 1 times 2 and get 0. No, that will always give you a whole number, okay? Well, a non-zero number, anyway. So, yes, it does obey uh, the integral domain property that the, um, that the only way to get two elements to multiply together to give zero is for one of them to be zero, uh, or at least one of them to be zero. Right, okay, so finally, let's just make sure it's not a field. And it's not a field because, remember, to be a field, you have to obey all of these properties. Well, they'll naturally obey the integral domain one. Okay, so if you obey the final property of a field, you automatically obey the integral domain property. Okay, so the final property that fields have is that every element other than zero, uh, which is the additive identity, uh, has a multiplicative inverse, okay? And uh, the reason that every element apart from zero will have a multiplicative inverse, and well, the reason that this property of having the um, uh, columns and rows um, containing every single element of the set at least once uh, was important and is related to this uh, property of every element having a multiplicative inverse is if you think about it, what does this row here represent? Well, let's give a symbol here. Okay, so let's call this symbol A. This basically tells you what A times every element of the set is. Okay, so you go along every single element of the set, and this will list off what A times that element is. Okay, uh, so if you want to be able to invert this operation, okay, so if you want there to be some A inverse which you can compose, which will map you automatically back onto x, then you can't have numbers appearing twice, because, for instance, if a number appeared twice, so, for instance, if one of these was 0 here, then, if we compose A inverse with 0, what does it map it onto? Does it map it onto 0, or does it map it onto whichever number was up here? You can't invert it, basically. It doesn't work. Because if you have multiple elements of the set being mapped onto the same number, you can't invert it. It would not work, because which number are we supposed to give A inverse multiplied by 0 to? Okay, so if there wasn't a 0 there, and if every number just appeared once in here, okay, then this would be easy to define, basically, because every number... So, if we wanted to define what A inverse of, let's say, any number in the set was, any number Y in the set was, then all we'd say is, where does Y appear in here? Okay, so we'd find Y, and then we'd say, which element do we have to multiply A by to get that? Okay, so there was some X up here, and A times X gave Y, and therefore we want A inverse of Y times Y, uh, to go back to this x here, okay? And then we're inverting a, basically. Okay, so if you have more... Uh, if you don't have columns and rows such that every symbol in the set appears once and only once, uh, then you can't do that, basically. And this is the reason you can't invert uh, zero, basically, because everything's mapped onto zero. So you can't possibly invert that, because if there was an inverse of zero, so if there was a zero inverse, a multiplicative inverse of zero, uh, then what should it send zero onto? Well, the answer is it should send, needs to somehow send it onto everything, but it can only pick one, so you can't possibly invert uh, zero, okay? Now, of course, there's a lot of other interpretations for why there is no, um, why you can't divide by zero. This is a very blunt sort of, we're creating little symbolic games here version of why you can't invert zero. Obviously, there's a much deeper interpretation because you have to remember that the algebraic structure the real numbers was made to mirror the one-dimensional continuum. So the fact that you can't divide by zero obviously has deeper interpretations as to uh, physical reality, okay? Uh, which is why people don't generally just quote 
abstract algebra when they're talking about the problem of dividing by zero. But that is the algebraic reason that you can't divide by the additive identity in a field. Uh, sim that simply, if you want distributivity to work, you can't define a multiplicative inverse of zero. You can go ahead and define it if you want, but I guarantee you that your algebraic structure will not obey distributivity. It won't be a field, basically. Uh, it, one of the other important algebraic properties will lift up, and that property is probably more important than having a multiplicative inverse for zero. That's the reason that there's no multiplicative inverse for zero as far as abstract algebra is concerned. But as I say, you have to remember that these models were, cr well, that the real numbers were created not for their algebraic properties, but to mirror the real one-dimensional continuum. And therefore, um, the reason you can't divide by zero obviously has philosophical uh, answers as well, uh, relating to the fact that it's an isomorphism of a structure that we think is critical to reality. Okay, right. Uh, so, where were we after that? Um, we were about to discuss the integers. Okay, so we have discussed the integers. So, we've agreed that they are an integral domain and they are not a field. Okay, so they're not a field because, for instance, 2. 2 doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. You can't, um, there's no multiplicative inverse of 0, there's no, sorry, there's no multiplicative inverse of 2, okay? There's no number in this set that I can multiply by 2 to get 1, okay? Absolutely not. So, which numbers do have multiplicative inverses? Well, does negative 2 have a multiplicative inverse? Again, no. Does 3 have a multiplicative inverse? Again, no. So, if we draw a little picture of this, so it's quite helpful usually to draw the integers as these sort of dots on the real line, okay? So, here we have some dots. So, here's 0, here's 1, here's negative 1, here's 2, here's negative 2. It just helps a bit more than having a picture like this, okay? So, all of the numbers over here, from 2 upwards, they don't have multiplicative inverses. We know 0 doesn't have a multiplicative inverse, and we know negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, they're not going to have multiplicative inverses as well. So all we've got left to consider is 1 and negative 1. 1 is the multiplicative identity, so 1 times 1 is 1, so um, 1 is its own multiplicative inverse, okay, so that's fine. Negative 1, okay, well, if we times negative 1 by negative 1, again, we get 1. So negative 1 does have a multiplicative inverse. Again, it's itself. Okay, so the only two numbers that have multiplicative inverses are 1 and negative 1 here. So these are the only two that have multiplicative inverses. So it's not a field yet. Now, you can put it inside a field. We all know that this exists inside a bigger field, though. It exists within the rationals, okay? So we can create a bigger structure, okay? So what we can do is we can say, add more symbols into this set here, okay? And extend the KV tables. So let me show what I mean, okay? And I might get a, I might go over the page for this. Right, so firstly, we make the set bigger, so, Let's say we start off with these little small Cayley tables here. So here are all the integers along here, and here are all the integers. This is addition, and here is our little Cayley table for multiplication. Here are all the integers, here are all the integers. What we're going to now do is add on a whole new bit here, okay? So I'm going to draw the end edges of these Cayley tables here for the integers. And now what we're going to do is stick on a whole new bunch of symbols here, okay, to make a bigger set, which I'm going to call the rationals, okay, so we're going to add in more symbols, and again we're obviously going to have to put these extra symbols in on here, and what we're going to end up with is a bigger Cayley table for addition. So we're going to have to define all of these answers in here, all of this is going to have to be defined. And again, we're going to do the same thing for multiplication. So we're going to make the Cayley table bigger like this. Whoops. Uh, so we're going to make, we're going to add in all these extra symbols, and then we're going to also have to define what uh, each one multiplied by each other one is. But we're also going to have to define what all of them multiplied by the symbols that we already had is. So we're not only going to have to 
define this portion of the KV table down here, which is the new symbols multiplied by other new symbols. But we're also going to have to uh, define new symbols multiplied by old symbols, and also old symbols multiplied by new symbols. Now, of course, fields are all commutative rings, so once we've um, defined this, we'll know what this is as well. Um, so we don't have too much work, as much work as it might seem. And again, we've got to define it for this addition as well. Right, uh, so, how did we do this? Because we need to try and look at how we did this for the integers, and we want to try and generalise it for an abstract integral domain. Okay, so how did we do it? Well, we started off with this set, which was 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, 4, Oh, I don't know, I'm just getting a little carried away here. I don't need to draw quite that many. Okay, now, we agreed that only 1 and negative 1 have uh, multiplicative inverses. So what we're going to do is define a new set, which is going to be all things of the form A over B. We define the fractions, basically, where A is an integer, and also B is an integer. So let me try and illustrate for you the scope of this set. How big is this set? Well, what we could do is we could put all the integers, okay? We have to put all of the integers in the top position, and we also have to put them all in the bottom position. And I should have just uh, made one little modification there. B is not equal to zero, okay? We're not going to try and divide by zero, because we acknowledge that even in a field, we don't need a multiplicative idea inverse of zero, and we're never ever going to have a multiplicative inverse of zero. If you try to define that, one of the other algebraic properties uh, would break, basically. It's, try it's like trying to fit a too big carpet into a sm too small room. Once you get one corner in place, another corner over somewhere else will lift up, basically. So, you can't fit the carpet, the too big carpet in the room. You can't get all of the other algebraic properties to work and have a multiplicative inverse for zero. If you put in a multiplicative inverse for zero, one of the other algebraic properties will break, basically. And the other algebraic properties, such as associativity and distributivity, are more important, basically. Okay, than having a multiplicative inverse for zero. So, let's say this is uh, the top position here, because I've put zero there. Okay, so we'll put all of the integers along here. Zero, naught, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, and you could go on. And then let's say this is the bottom position here, so B for bottom. And um, we won't put zero there, because we're not going to use zero in the bottom. Okay, and then we'll put all the others apart from zero there. And then what we'll do is we'll go along and define them. So we'll have zero over one, we'll have one over one, we'll have negative one over one, two over one, negative two over one, and then next we'll change the one on the bottom to this one here. So we'll have zero over negative one, we'll have one over negative one, we'll have negative one over negative one, we'll have two over negative one, We'll have negative 2 over negative 1, and we'll go on. We'll then have 0 over 2, and then 1 over 2, negative 1 over 2, 2 over 2. Okay, so this creates a beautiful set, but is this the fractions? Well, you can say yes it is, uh, but there's something a little bit uh, redundant about this, because basically there are loads of these that are all equivalent in the fractions. Okay, so for instance, 0 over 1 is the same thing as 0 over negative 1, which is the same thing as 0 over 2. Also, if we look at things like negative 1 over negative 1, that's the same thing as 1 over 1 here, or 2 over 2 over here. So there's a lot of redundancy. So what we're actually going to do is cluster some of these symbols together into sets, basically, or um, equivalence classes, as they're called. So we're going to not use this set as the basis of our field. We're not going to use this as the basis of our field. Instead, what we're going to do is make equivalence classes of this set. So we're going to chop this set up into pieces, and we're going to group all of the things that we would consider equivalent to one another together.
Okay, so for instance, we will group all of these ones here. 1 over 1, negative 2, sorry, negative 1 over negative 1, 2 over 2. We'll group all of those together because they're all equivalent. Which other equivalent ones can we spot on here? Okay, so again here, negative 2 over negative 1. That's equivalent to 2 over 1 here. Okay, and before you say, oh, is it just working on the diagonals? Well, it's not quite that simple. You know, it's not that the diagonals are all going to be equivalent, because look, if we look here, negative 1 over 1 is certainly not equivalent to uh, 2 over negative 1. Okay, uh, but we will sort of divide things up in this equivalent way. So how are we defining this, uh, these equivalence classes? So if I draw a picture, we have this box, this set, which contains all of these symbols, and you would be here for a long time writing them all out, okay? So imagine that they are all now written out, and they're contained within this box here, okay? And this is one of the things people have problems with believing, those people who don't believe in infinite set theory have problems with this, because of course you can't write this out. Okay, uh, but we'll we'll take the analysis point of view, and uh, we'll we'll say that um, we can do that. This box contains absolutely every single one of these um, fractions that we've just created. Okay, right. So we now want to partition it up, basically. We want to split it up into these equivalence classes of fractions that we're going to consider equivalent. Okay, so these are fractions like 1 over 1, negative 1 over negative 1, 2 over negative 2. They would all be together in a single one of these equivalence classes. Okay, so we want to put them all together. And of course, they'd also be with negative 2 over negative 2, and then onwards, 3 over 3, all of those. Okay, uh, so this obviously is the equivalence class uh, containing the uh, additive, sorry, the multiplicative identity. Okay, so how are we doing this? Well, basically, we are saying that um, these two things are going to be equivalent, but how are we judging that? We know that they're equivalent, um, but what we, what we mean by that, really, is that 1 over 1 is somehow equal to negative 1 over negative 1. But we're using our intuition for uh, this number system to do that. We have to remember that we're soon going to be working just with symbols. So how can we do that symbolically? Well, firstly, we get rid of the equals and we put is equivalent to instead. So this uh, sort of uh, little, um, oh, I don't know, a squiggle, it means is equivalent to. Okay, so how are we going to define these things which are equivalent to? Well, there's no concept of division is the first thing, okay? We're working with a ring, remember? So there's no concept of division, okay? So we have to use things that we do have, and we have multiplication. So what about just getting rid of the division? What would we do in the fractions? We'd say, you know, um, we can multiply on both sides by negative 1, and multiply on both sides by 1 and get rid of them in the denominator, basically. So we're going to bring this one up here and this one up here to replace them by multiplication. And that's something now uh, that um, is defined, basically. So we're going to say, basically, that A over B, the fraction A over B, is going to be equivalent to the fraction C over D if AD is equal to BC, and I should say that people who, when doing ring theory often uh, drop the multiplication, they just write um, the two opposed to one another, next to one another, to mean the two multiply together. So, if you have two fractions within your set, and we're now imagining that we're just talking about symbols, we're not talking about uh, a number system we ha that we have any sort of intuition for, okay? Uh, so we're just talking about symbols, then We've got a ring structure, so we can do these operations here, okay? Now, we've created the set of fractions, and what we want to do is define these equivalence classes, and we'll define them to be equivalent, the two fractions to be equivalent, if A times D, so the numerator of one fraction times the denominator of the other fraction is equal to the denominator of the first fraction times the numerator of the second fraction, i.e. if this uh, equation here is true. Okay, so if you can compose A and D by multiplication, 
uh, together in the original ring and get some symbol which is the same as B times C in that ring, then we'll define the two to be equivalent. Now, we need to check that that actually does partition the set. It does produce a valid partition of the set, okay? But now we'll generalize it, because at the moment I was just sort of talking about what we were doing with fractions. Now I'm going to actually um, officially sort of talk about this for general integral domains. Okay, so in the more general context, when we're talking about a general integral domain, Okay, what we're going to firstly produce is this set of all fractions, okay, which is this set of A over B, just in this exact same way, one symbol over another symbol. You can easily make these new funny symbols, which are fractions, okay, and A can be any element of the domain, whereas B can be an element of the domain, but not the additive identity, okay, so not the additive identity within the domain. And remember, we usually use zero for the additive identity of any ring, so we've taken that symbol from, obviously, uh, the integers, uh, but we use it in abstract integral domains. So this is an abstract integral domain now. It's not the one that we have intuition for. It's not the one that people use to actually do shopping with anymore. It's um, potentially some ridiculous abstract thing. Okay, right. Uh, so... Can we still do this? Can we still define equivalence classes like this? Well, we do need to check that this uh, way of defining equivalence is actually going to produce a valid partition of the set. So, we can certainly create this set. There's no problem with that. You don't even need, um, well, in order to know which one's the additive identity, I suppose you do need to have an integral domain structure, but this is something that you can do with set theory. You don't need anything algebraic to do that. All you need to be able to do is create symbols to do that. So, this is perfectly well defined. Now, what we need to check is that this way of putting fractions together into an equivalence class like this is actually going to produce a valid partition. Okay, so how do we check that it actually produces a valid partition? Well, there are, um, there are criterion that equivalence classes have to obey to, um, to actually partition the setup properly. Okay, so firstly, we need to make sure that every symbol is related to itself. So every symbol is going to be in an equivalence class with itself is the first thing. Okay, so remember what we're going to do when we produce an equivalence class is we're going to put all of the things which are related to each other in the same uh, little equivalence class. Okay, so what does we need to, what does it need to obey in order to um, successfully partition up the set? So it needs to obey something known as reflexivity, okay? Uh, so, uh, in fact, I think this is probably best called reflexiveness rather than reflexivity, but we'll leave it there for now. Okay, so we need to make sure that every fraction is equivalent to itself. So AB needs to be equivalent to AB, where A is any element of the domain and B is any element of the domain bar, the additive identity. Okay, so if they're going to be equivalent, then... The numerator of fraction 1 needs to multiply by the denominator of fraction 2, and that needs to be the same as uh, the denominator of fraction 1 multiplied by the numerator of fraction 2. And this, of course, is true because we were dealing with a commutative ring. So this wouldn't have necessarily been true if we were dealing with a non-commutative ring. But, of course, we were dealing with a domain which is a commutative ring. So, basically, it does obey reflexivity, so that's good. And I should just say, what actually is an equivalence relation? Well, an equivalence relation, basically, if you define an equivalence relation on a set, imagine putting this set here. Okay, so I don't know what to call this set of fractions. I'll call it just S. So imagine putting every element of the set of fractions, so all of these symbols here, all of these fractions along here, and then you would... When you're... What you're asking now is you'll go down each one of these... Um, one of these fractions in this set, and they'll all be in this great column here, and then you'll ask, is it related to each one of these? And you'll fill out the table, basically. So you'll make a great big table like this. So you'll start off with the first fraction, and you'll ask, is it related to this one? And then you can either put in a tick or a cross, so it's a yes or no answer. Okay? So, basically, what this reflexivity means is that... 
whenever you say, whenever you take this first element here and you ask, is it related to itself here, which let's imagine that we put the uh, factions in the same order, i.e. as we go down here, the first one here is the same one here. So it would make sense if you were to draw out a table to put the two in the same order. Okay, so we're now asking, is A related to A? And basically we're saying that all of these will have ticks in. So basically we're saying that all the diagonal um, entries will be ticks, assuming that we put all of the um, entries of S in the same order in this row as we do in this column, then all the diagonal entries will be yes. So that's what reflexivity really means. Okay, then it needs to obey something known as symmetry. Okay, so symmetry is that if a fraction is equivalent to um, another fraction, then it also implies that this fraction is equivalent to that fraction. Okay, so basically this says that if you take an element and ask, is it equivalent to another element over here, and you get yes or no, then when you ask, is this element equivalent to this element on the other side, basically, you'll get the same answer. So basically it's saying that this array of ticks and uh, crosses is uh, symmetrical down the diagonal line, basically. Okay, so we need to check that it is symmetrical in this way, that if you have one element, one fraction, which is in an equivalence class with another one, then the other one is also in the equivalence class with that one. Okay, so... Um, right, so AB is related to CD if and only if A times D is equal to B times C, and uh, CD is related to A times B if and only if the numerator of this first fraction, C, times the denominator of this second fraction is equal to uh, the denominator of this first fraction, D, times the numerator of this second fraction, A. Okay, now this, of course, just follows by commutativity again, so we can swap both of these around. We can say that this is BC and this is AD. So if this is true, it implies that this one is also true. So basically, we've got that, yes, it will obey symmetry if you create this equivalence relation. And of course, you could fill in this table now. Basically, if I put every single fraction along here and also down here, you could go through and fill out this great big table. You could go through each one painstakingly at a time and say, is this one related to this one? All I need to do is look and see if this is hot, holds true. If it holds true, great, put a tick there. If it doesn't, put a cross there, okay? And I'm telling you that this, if you produce this great table, it will be symmetric, and this is the proof, basically. Okay, we then need to obey one final property for it to successfully uh, split up the... Um, set into partitions, which is transitivity. Okay, now transitivity says that if one fraction is related to another fraction, and another fraction, sorry, CD is related to another fraction, EF, then it needs to imply that AB is related to EF. So what does this say? This says that if you have one symbol which is related to another symbol, and then you ask, is this next symbol here related to a third symbol? And the answer is also yes. Then it needs to imply that the first symbol is also related to the third symbol. Now, this is the key thing, basically. This is why this is going to partition the set properly. Because this says that if you take one element, which is in the same uh, par partition as another element, and this other element is in the same partition as this element here, then it means that this one is also in the same partition as that one, okay? Which is obviously something that needs to hold true, basically. This is what actually allows us to use this relation to partition up the set. Okay, right. So, how are we going to show this? Well, from these two facts here, we get that AD is equal to BC from this one, and from this one we get that CF is equal to that DE. Okay, and what we need to show is that AF is equal to BE. Okay, so how are we going to do that? 